Can you? Right. What have you got to offer? Because we have, and when I say we, I don't mean all of the world, because obviously not all of the world does follow what the US does, but so much of the world has, so much of my growing up with relatives back in Poland, we looked to the United States. Should we be doing so now, given what has been happening? I'm not just talking about the withdrawal from Afghanistan. I'm not just talking about your inability to sort out your debt ceiling. Is America still the indispensable leader? Yes. <laughs> End of discussion, everybody. <laughs> Well, I like how you hyped it up. Well, the <laughs> United States has led since the end of World War II. We will continue to lead, and, and I think we, should, we need to take on that mantle of leadership for the democracies of the free world because, in my view, we are now in this era of great power competition where the autocracies of the world, led by China and Russia, are challenging the international order as we know it, rules and norms, and democracy itself. And so, yes, the United States needs to lead. We need to continue to lead but we need all of our allies and partners with us in that endeavor. But do you have, and again, this is, I'm, I'm being problematically difficult here. Do you have the authority anymore to lead given your choices and given we are going into, let's, let's like address the elephant in the room here right now. We're going into an election year. America will turn on itself. You'll become increasingly more isolationist. You're not gonna care about what happens internationally around the world. Why should you be leading? You know, we had this show years ago in the United States called The Jerry Springer Show. <laughs> I kind of feel like I'm on that set right now. Uh, <laughs> I've never been compared to that before. Thank you. That's a, that's a first. You did, now, you did get a little ruffled when I said, well, yeah, didn't the UK go through four prime ministers in four months? Look, democracies are messy, right? This, this government in this country, Slovakia, a wonderful country, is going through its own challenges. But that's the price you pay for your citizens having a voice, for having to say who's going to lead their country, the policies they want uh, wanted to take going forward and how we treat one another right so we're going through that period you're right typically during a, an election year you look more inward not more further isolationist but more inward and then we'll pop back out of that of course and we'll have a new president or not and uh, look we'll continue to lead but you don't you, you, leaders need followers leaders need friends and allies all those things we do it together and we lead by consensus but that's what we're going to need if we're going to take on the future and win it. But okay, so you use the word, you look inwards, I use the word isolationist. And again, again just trying to be a little bit provocative here, uh, Mark, we go back a long way, it's fine. Um, you promised you wouldn't mention the- um, Liz Truss. Yeah, the UK political side of oh, things. Oh, did I just but anyway, well, yeah, yeah, I think you just did again. Anyway, that's your last chance. Um, look, the point is, is with US politics being so, uh, di divisive you are on two ex your, your extremists are pulling away you're so polar now like i say you know i, I throw in the debt uh, ceiling but it's not a joke right okay we've been here before but if you can't even get your politicians to agree on lifting the debt limit why on earth should the rest of the world really really be looking to you as, as a leader because you will be going looking right. inward and it's going to be a long time because u.s politics i mean u.s election cycles they go on for a long long so time. let me unwind that a little bit look it, we're gonna we're gonna solve the debt issue we've been through this like 80 times in the last 80 years and i've been through it personally a few times myself so i'm convinced we'll resolve that but the the real point that you touched on is the 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 uh our politics right and I speak a lot. I, I'm on television and people will say, what's the greatest threat the United States faces? And, and the expectation is I'm going to say the Chinese Communist Party or Moscow under Putin. But it's not. The greatest challenge the United States faces is extreme political partisanship coming from both wings of our political spectrum. And until we can solve that issue, until we can get more people working together, solving issues, whether it's the debt, whether it's immigration, climate, you name it, we won't be able to, to address the really big issues such as China and Russia and climate and the debt and everything else as effectively as we could. And to me, that's the biggest concern that uh, I have and the biggest threat that I see facing the United States right now. And I don't see an end, right, in, in, the, near, in the near term. So how, okay, so on a serious note, how you- you're That gonna, was a serious it, note. It was a serious note. On a, yes, another serious note, because ultimately we know where we're leading with this, um, that we, we have got, a war in Europe and a lot of 
what the US does, the rest of the world will follow in terms of supporting Ukraine. Just coming to the potential of the candidates for the Republican Party. Now, we know your relationship with um, aforementioned Donald Trump. We know, it, it, I, I'll let you explain it, but um, difficult, troubled, I, I don't want to put Rocky. Words, Rocky, you know. Um, what happens if he does become the next Republican leader? And what happens if he does? And again, I'm having a great time asking lots of questions. Please ask questions, because this is an incredible opportunity. Mark is being extremely honest with us here. This is fantastic. What happens if um, that rocky relationship you had with Donald Trump, if he does become once again president of the U.S.? Well, look, he, he could become president again. I hope he doesn't become president again. I've said I think he's unfit for office. But uh, look, the American people decide. And uh, we have uh, the race underway now within the Republican primary. We have a few candidates. Uh, DeSantis and Scott entered last week. The first debate will be this summer in August. That's, you know, so we'll see things uh, start to filter out there. But the first primary election isn't until uh, February of next year. So we have a lot of time to go. And I'm hopeful that one of these candidates out there will rise up and will take the mantle for the Republican uh, Party. We talk about the tough times of today, and I'm going to go back a little bit because it's, it's important historically for me. But this, in some ways, this period is not different than the 1970s, right? Prior to Ronald Reagan's entry onto the scene, we, we had high energy prices. We have a stumbling economy. The president told us, don't worry that your homes are cold. Just put on a sweater. We had high inflation. I mean, it was not a good situation. Morale in the United States was down. And then Ronald Reagan came onto the scene. He promised this shining city on the hill. He inspired a nation. He rebuilt the military. And we know the rest, right? It's, it's very important, particularly in this part of the world. And so I believe America is going to rebound. I believe there's, we need a new a generation of leaders from both parties. And hopefully one of them will be a Reagan-esque type of person who will inspire a nation, inspired me to go to West Point. And that's what I'm hoping for. I don't see that yet, but that's the promise we have out there. It's great to get your questions in. We've got a few coming in uh, already, and I will come to them in a moment, but so keep them coming. But just, on, on, just, just to push down, just to drill in onto this potential next Republican presidential candidate, we saw... And you say you've got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. We saw Ron DeSantis and his... I don't, do you, how do you describe his... Um, opening campaign, glitchy, technical gremlins, however you want to call it, it wasn't exactly brilliant. Um, and we're, it just takes so much energy. The international press, we're talking about Elon Musk and Twitter rather than talking about your F-16 policy uh, of training Ukrainian pilots. Do you see what I mean? It's The whole world looks towards the US and you're grappling amongst yourselves, DeSantis is fighting Disney. I mean, there was a time when I was doing a headline and we were talking about King Charles, the mouse, and DeSantis in one same headline. But don't talk about those things. But we have to because no, you it's, don't. It's, it's all encompassing. This is, you know, the media likes to hype these things up. I oh. get it, right? Uh, look, again, it's a long primary. We have six candidates or so on the Republican side, a lot of strange dynamics going on on the Democrat side. We're going to see where this race goes. Most of the candidates, and I include Governor DeSantis, I think will be in the right spot with regard to Russia, China, Ukraine, you name it. But uh, there's going to be a contest underway, and um, we're going to have some strong candidates in the Republican field. And I think the, they will be candidates, except for Trump, that most people in, in Europe, our friends in, in NATO, will, will like. Look, it's... It's not just me, and I know you're, you're probably thinking that I've come in here to be devil's advocate and it's just the media hyping things up. The questions are coming in. Thank you. Keep them coming in. One from an anonymous. Come on. Oh, come name on. yourselves. Uh, if the greatest challenge to U.S. leadership is internal politics, why can't the U.S. move for serious electoral reform on, campaigning, on campaign financing and voting access? So... Electoral reform. It's not just me that's got a bit of a bugbear about this. Go. Yeah, I mean, a couple of those are tropes, right, uh, that are played out. W w United States has great voter access. We had the largest elections in the, in the 2020 series. Uh, so I, I don't think that's the issue. I think the, the question is, the biggest problem we face is you have primaries that are uh, primary elections in both parties, right, where the most active participants, the activists, actually drive the candidate. And so you end up producing candidates who oftentimes have to work their way back to the middle. To me, the electoral form 
uh, it needs to focus on those aspects. How do we get more uh, middle of the road candidates, give them a chance to survive a primary, if indeed you have a primary, and be able to compete in the, in the, the election? Most of America is in that broad 70% in the middle. They wanna see reasonable candidates that can sit down with members of the other party and, uh, and, can, and can resolve problems and compromise. I mean, that's what Reagan said. Reagan said, I'll take 80%. And that's what we don't have nowadays. It's, uh, we have these extreme positions and people are trapped by those on the wings. So again, thank you for your questions. They're coming through and quite a few anonymouses. I'm gonna just keep away from the anonymouses Good. until I get proper uh, names, names to faces. You can also put your hands up and we've got roving mics around the room. So do, if you want to put a question in person, it would be great to hear your voice and see your face. But thank you Heinrich Kreft who has put forward a question. And again, it continues with this idea of polarization. What has to be done? What has to be overcome? in terms of the polarization in the US? What do you do to overcome it? Well, I talked about the electoral part and part of it's gonna be also, I, I spoke about the promise of a future leader who, who will really dial down the rhetoric, right? And can lead his or her party in a direction where we say, look, we're not gonna, we're gonna stop with the name calling. We're gonna stop saying this idea is crazy or wacko and all this other stuff and, and respect people's positions, uh, what they bring to the table and really sit down and work with them. It, it just, you gotta get the leadership to change their positions. And this is, again, both parties, White House, Congress, you name it, and, uh, and really take a more responsible approach. In many ways, in, in my party, the Republican Party, we often like to vote for governors because governors have had to do that. They, they uh, often governor, govern in states that are more purple than they are, uh, than they are red, and they have to make those compromises. They have to fix the roads, make sure the trash is picked up, and do all other big city stuff, but at the same time, uh, often work with their democratic legislatures or councils. And so that's the type of leadership we need. That's, believe it or not, that's what most Americans want out of their, le out of their government. Okay, um, please do raise your hands if you've got a question. I am looking around and I'm catching your eye. Also keep using the, uh, the Slido format. There's a hashtag there somewhere. I'm too old to talk about hashtags. Uh, we've got a great question coming in from, um, right, there was one that I did want to ask you in terms of your personal and your lived experience. How would you handle the Russian-Ukraine war if you were the Secretary of Defense of the US again? Thank you to Anonymous, but it's a great question. Yeah, so I think uh, I'll, I'll give in terms of commenting on the Biden administration. I, I think the administration, there were some initial missteps on messaging. If you recall, the President Biden said something about a minor incursion versus a major incursion. And all that does is, I think, incent Putin. But I think the administration has done a good job in terms of bringing the allies together, um, on, on bringing NATO together, and then also uh, organizing all of our partners, not just in Europe, but abroad too, with regard to economic, diplomatic, financial sanctions, so forth and so on. And so all that's been good, right? Uh, what I've been very critical of is the slowness in deciding the delivery of, of, of major weapon systems, whether it was Stingers, HIMARS, Patriot, Abrams and now F-16s, it's been way too tardy. And much of it is because we've been self-deterred. I, be, I would have been pushing to give the Ukrainians what they need, what they're asking for as quickly as possible and, and, and not had set these either artificial reasons or been so self-deterred worried about what Putin will say or do. We went through this as well, if you recall initially when Sweden and Finland said, we wanna join NATO and there was some hand wringing, right? Uh, because what will Putin do? And that we said, then we finally, got mustered up our courage and said, yes, NATO accession. And Putin said, well, I'm, I'm okay with that as long as they don't put a permanent base on the Finnish border, right? We've been way too self-deterred and that's not the way you deal with autocrats. We, we know what needs to be done. We have to defend this young democracy who's showing great courage and skill and grit on the battlefield. And they are, the, they are fighting the first battle of this 21st century fight between the democracies and autocracies. So fully support them. And look, uh, there are other ways to get around these problems. People said, well, we won't have the F-16s for a year or so. Great, let's go back to the World War II idea of Eagle Squadrons, right? Where you took volunteers of pilots and maintainers to help them put, you, put pilots in the sky, planes in the sky to help with this offensive. But we've been too slow and not innovative enough to, in thinking of how we, how we can do this. And look, the other thing I'll say is uh, the Ukrainians uh, have, have uh, shown us that when your country's being decimated, uh, where you've, you're losing your sovereignty, that it doesn't take you 18 months to learn how to fly an airplane. You can do it in four or five or six. And we should have learned that by now. And always, always absolutely critical to remember the number of people who have lost their lives in this. 
and also the millions of people who have been displaced. I witnessed that at the start of the war, and it's absolutely crucial just to remember that when we talk about these kind of things. But just to drill down a little bit more into what you say, self-deterred, it's a throwaway phrase. What do you mean? You know, self-deterred comes from somewhere. Is it the self, the polarization? Is it the fact that at one point you had Donald Trump sitting across the table from President Putin? Where does this self-determent come from? Well, I think this comes from the White House uh, and, and probably other parts of the administration. And I think we, we're just too concerned about what Putin may do. And, and, and Putin very strategically and cleverly rattles that nuclear saber every now and then, right? And he says, well, I may do this. And this week, it's been about delivering tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus. And look, we need to be very concerned about that. We need to watch it. I think it's highly unlikely. But that doesn't mean we should, we should hesitate in terms of doing what Ukraine needs to win. We've been giving, it seems we've been giving them enough at the right time not to lose, but not quickly enough to win. And we need to get on the other side of that ledger. Antonia Pup asks, how is the idea of strategic autonomy of Europe seen from Washington, D.C.? Could this be a solution for the broader, for the broader sharing of concerns? Uh, strategic autonomy of Europe seen from Washington, D.C. How, does the, how did the two work? Do you even the look answer to is, The answer is no. I do not believe in strategic autonomy, right? And that's been a longstanding French position. I understand it, but whenever I hear those words, it means to me competition with NATO and it undermines the alliance. And so I believe that the, the centerpiece of security uh, in the transatlantic relationship is NATO. It's the greatest alliance in history. I served in it as a young army, army officer stationed in Italy in the early 1990s when everything opened up here in Europe. And uh, it, it will continue to be a great uh, alliance. And nobody, frankly, has done more to unify it than Vladimir Putin. So uh, I don't believe in strategic autonomy. That said, I do believe in the notion that uh, all of our European allies need to do more to improve their capabilities, to improve uh, th their security uh, frameworks and networks, so that if they want to do something as a subgroup, then they can do that, but within the NATO construct and within NATO as we know it. So that's my view on strategic autonomy. So when we- Is that candid enough? It's, it's pretty, pretty, okay. pretty good, yeah. actually. Get your questions in, put your hands up. Let's see your, yes, we've got a gentleman here. Uh, and while we wait for the microphone to get to you, I just want a quick question, and Mark, while we're waiting for the microphone to reach these guys. Um, at, at, at the NATO strategic summit last year, I was there, there was so much, a support for Ukraine. When will Ukraine, not if, when will Ukraine become a part of NATO, Mark? Yeah, it is a, it is a question of when, not if. And um, it, I don't believe it'll be in Vilnius. Um, but but we, we need to have a, a game plan. And, and maybe there are interim steps between now and them, then. But I think the sooner the better. And uh, that's going to be something that needs to be discussed in Vilnius. But I, I think we need to be thinking that way. How can we move that way? How can we signal not just to the Ukrainians, but to the other allies and to Moscow? about the fact that uh, they need to get their heads around the fact that Ukraine is going to be in NATO. And, and to Turkey, Erdogan's just won? Well, th th that's very simple. Uh, uh, President Erdogan needs to say, announce today that he's going to approve NATO's accession and Hungary needs to follow suit. And we need to see um, Sweden in um, on 15th. They should have a chair at Vilnius. Lots of, there'll be lots to pick up on, but there was a gentleman just in that row with, if you could keep your sh question brief, I'd be very grateful. Yes, uh, former Marine here, uh, U.S. Marine Secretary Esper, so my question does have a naval component to it. Yes, the Marines are great. We should have more Marines. Hoorah. Uh, <laughs> Wait you. for the question but, uh, mark. My question is, uh, if you could say a couple of words about in the next five, 10 years, what you think the U.S. and Chinese naval posturing would look like in the Indo-Pac. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm glad you brought it up because, uh, I mean, I know this audience knows, but it's worth stating. If there's one issue that unifies Republicans and Democrats and the White House and Congress in Washington, D.C., it's China as the threat and the top threat, I might say. And we don't see that lessening anytime soon. Uh, China now has the world's largest Navy. They have had, had it for a few years and they are challenging us and Taiwan and allies throughout the region. And not just, we all tend to think of the Taiwan Strait, but this goes all the way around uh, Asia, in, obviously in the Himalayas, where I had to work with my counterpart when we had the Chinese incursions in May of 2020. So look, China is, uh, is more aggressive, more belligerent. Uh, Xi Jinping is now has his third term as uh, chairman of the party. He wants his mark in history alongside Mao. And his, uh, the biggest thing he's going to wants to do to, to put himself in the pantheon of great Chinese leaders is to reclaim Taiwan. So I think it's vitally important that the United States 
not just improve its armed forces, but the Navy in particular, and we've been too slow at it. Um, we, we're, we're not moving aggressively enough to build not just a bigger Navy, because it's not just about the size, but it's a, it's a, a more capable Navy that, can, uh, that, that has characteristics such as distributed lethality, that can fight in the Pacific, that has more attack submarines, all those things we need to, uh, to deter conflict with China, and if deterrence fails, to beat them. But would it not just be a little bit more helpful if the U.S. was a little bit more clear in its relationship with Taiwan? In its... I, I think we've been pretty clear. I mean, look, we have the one China policy, and I've argued that that is, it's outdated in many ways. We can talk if you want to get into that. But look, uh, President Biden has said on four occasions that the uh, United States would come to Taiwan's assistance, and I think it's the right call. Now, surprisingly, his staff walked him back each and every time, which doesn't add to any clarity for Beijing. Uh, but we continue to, to increase arm sales. I actually think those need to be prioritized. And uh, they need to be reprioritized and, and, and shipped abroad into Taiwan far more quickly. And uh, at the same time, we've had great support. Uh, Taiwanese have had great support from the Japanese, who have said that an invasion of Taiwan would threaten their security. Uh, the, uh, Tokyo under Kashida has doubled its defense spending. It's remarkable. Doubled it, going to, to 2% in the next three, four years now. And then has taken on the role of, uh, of, of procuring offensive weapons. So there's a lot of movement in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, people have known for many years that China is a bully, the coercion they use. We can talk about specific examples. Uh, we could talk about what they've uh, tried to do, do to Lithuania here in Europe, right? So um, that's why we see it as a, the greatest threat. And I think the key will be not just, again, the United States, but the United States and its allies, and not just in the Indo-Pacific, but in Europe as well. Again, sending the right signals to Beijing that, that, that they need to back off. Thank you for indulging me. The lady in the green dress, yes. Thank you. My name is Sasha Ostein. I'm a foreign policy and security policy fellow at the Berlin-based Czech Dolores Center. Um, back to Ukraine, um, in your opinion, do you think that the U.S. is ready to continue consistently supplying weapons to Ukraine, um, even when Ukraine moves forward to liberating or recapturing Crimea? Yeah, I think so right now. In the short term, this gets into the political question, and I'll, I'll kind of take us there. So... Right now, clearly, I think the Biden administration is saying, saying the right things about continued support to Ukraine. And so far, uh, leadership in both the House and, and Senate in both parties is solid, right? Now, the challenge is you have Republican voters. Numbers are less than 50% in terms of continuing support. And we can talk about why, right? Part of it is a lot of concern about a $32, $33 trillion debt in our country. That's why this debt ceiling debate is so so acute right now, but you also have Donald Trump saying we shouldn't do that. You have other Republicans saying that the threat's not Russia, it's China, and that appeals to a lot of folks. So look, I, I think it holds for now, but depending on how the politics goes over the next six, eight, 10, 12 months, that support could erode, could, could erode in terms of continuing to provide support. Now, I'm not saying that to spook you, I'm just trying to be very candid with you as to what I see is happening. I think nearly all the candidates, except for Trump, will, and, and we, I think DeSantis will come out and be more firm about this, will say we need to keep supporting Ukraine. Uh, people like me on the outside who, who have a voice will continue to say we need to keep supporting Ukraine. So it, it, it's something we need to work on in, back in the States and something I hope will continue. It's a, it's a candid answer. Are you satisfied with that? No. no because uh, because I didn't tell you that. what you heard or because? Oh, because you didn't answer the question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Oh, look, I, I completely agree that we, it, it is of fundamental importance, not just because it's <laughs> Ukraine's survival, but it's what we do in Ukraine uh, signals what Putin may do later, and more, more important, but importantly, what Beijing is going to do. So I think it's critical that we win this fight and that we not show any weakness to Putin, because showing weakness to Putin shows weakness to Xi Jinping. Does that answer your question? Okay. More, more or less, more or less. But the whole point... There's a about, magic word I'm missing there. So. Listen, and, and that's not me asking the questions. That's one of that's our good. esteemed uh, members of the audience. It's about being candid, and we do appreciate your candid yeah. um, answers as well. The gentleman there in the back. Yes, sir. Hello. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, my name is Alan Kim. I am perhaps the most underrepresented Asian here. But as you can take it from Kim, uh, I served in the Korean military. Korea is a very strong ally of the United States. Kapshi, Kapshi da, right? Yeah, and we host the largest U.S. base in the world. Uh, we've been still stuck at war for 63 years. 
So it's a, it's a very sad wake up call for us every day because we're literally still at war. Uh, I'm very curious how the US policy looking at Taiwan and also rearming Japan, uh, if the escalation does happen in Asia, uh, our Korean stance is that it's going to be incomparable to the amount of escalation because of vested interest uh, in the Northeast Asia corridor compared to Ukraine. I'm not trying to you know, say that the Ukrainian situation is small, but my question is, how willing do you think the American military can stretch its front, uh, putting Korean soldiers as myself, well, I'm much older for that now, but uh, do you think it could escalate to the Koreans actually being mobilized for containing China? Thank you. Well, that's a big question. Look, I, I think the United States has a lot of capacity. Uh, actually, a, a preponderance of our forces are in the Indo-Pacific. Most people don't understand that or know that. And uh, I, I, I've, I've said, I've written in my book, uh, by the way, that the, the world's greatest strategic flashpoint is Northeast Asia. And people say, why? Well, we have, what, four or five nuclear powers there, if you count nuclear, North Korea. You have the world's three largest economies, the United States, Japan, and China. You have some of the most high-tech countries in the world located there, right? United States, China, Korea, Taiwan, et cetera. So if something happens there, the, the repercussions will ripple out around the world globally. And I think that's, it would be really, really bad. So I think we need to uh, avoid a conflict in Northeast Asia. Uh, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't prepare for one, because in my view, again, I'm a Reaganite, peace through strength deters conflict. But um, look, if something like that happens, I don't think we can ever take any, any ally or any asset off the table. And if, if, if a fight like that, mean, if winning means pulling, if you're asking the question, would U.S. forces Korea join in that fight? Maybe. I would never take it off the table. Uh, and, and I don't think Korea should, too. I, you have a great president now, President Yoon, who's done some remarkable stuff. Um, I, I think one of the things that has troubled me about in the, previously with Korea was uh, you wanted the United States to provide your security. We were the national security partner, but China was your economic security partner. And I don't think those two are positions were reconcilable in the long run. And so I, I think part of this is Seoul getting its head around its position if, if that happens and what's going to be its long-term position with regard to China. We've been jumping around the world. Uh, let's focus in on South um, America and South Asia. A question from, again, Anonymous. How should the U.S. respond to increasing global fragmentation when countries such as India and Brazil often do not support American policies, Mark? Well, you know, I, I've described China as the uh, greatest strategic partnership that the United States needs to build in this coming century, right? Given its, its size, it's now or soon will be the largest country in the world. It's very technologically advanced. Uh, there, there, it has a lot of attributes, right? So to be candid, I've been disappointed in India w in its position on, on uh, Russia and the evasion of Ukraine. I, I, I kind of understand some of the reasons, but it doesn't make sense to me. And, you know, one thing just like to thank Madam President for greeting us here and hosting us here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Apologies, Mark. Was it something you said? I, I, it's always something I said. It's always me. Always. Uh, so I, I've been disappointed by uh, Delhi's approach to this. And uh, part, again, in this era of, strategic, of uh, glo great power competition, um, you know, you give what you get. And it, it, I think if China were to threaten, seriously threaten India, they would expect the democracies of the world to come assist them. And, and I think there's an obligation as a, the world's largest democracy to assist Ukraine. And so, uh, so that's kind of my, my view on that front. But we still need to build that relationship. And then, look, I was disappointed by President Lula's remarks as well, uh, just a week or so ago with regard to the conflict. And you know, it's, we had a, we've had a couple UN votes so far in, um, in, in New York on the issue of Ukraine, its invasion, some good words, but out of 190 some countries, only, only 130 or so voted in favor of it. So there's a large swath of countries who are sitting on the fence. And of course, of those 133, there's only about 30 who are providing support. And again, this is, again, the international global order is at stake here. And that's why I think we need to be all in, or more of us should be in, in terms of defending it. I, th I think that leads us nicely into, we've got another question over here, but just while we wait for the microphone to reach you, oh, and it has, brilliant, thank you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Monica Polotai from Washington, D.C., Hudson Institute. My question would be that now that F-16s and Abrams being sent to Ukraine, and perhaps Atacams, what is the next feasible step in terms of military hardware? Yeah, it's a good question. Nothing, nothing jumps to mind for me. Uh, it, it could be, there could be items from our missile inventory, ours being NATO's missile inventory, that would help. I mean, increasingly conflict in today and in the future is going to be long range precision strike. And so there may be weapon systems that they don't have. Uh, at some point, we're going to seriously, th they may be thinking about how do you sink the Black Sea fleet, for example, or threaten it. So I, I, don't, I don't know right now what, what exactly they're asking for, but it seems like a, a big chunk of the items has been met. You, you, you laid out ATACMs, um, but nothing immediately comes to mind. Maybe attack helicopters or something like that. But I think they have the means, or they should, but they don't. They will have the means to do what they need to do. Interestingly, uh, gets back to the Ukraine and NATO issue. Uh, Ukraine maybe is now, soon will be uh, one of the most powerful countries in Europe and one of the most interoperable with NATO because of all that... Uh, United States and all its allies have given it. So it's, it's a striking turnaround for a country that was still using Soviet equipment, you know, 15 months ago. You touched upon how more internationally, it, it, the international community needs to step up. We've got a, a really good, um, interesting question from, again, oh no, it's not anonymous, it's Ned Helsing. Thank you, Ned. Uh, whilst you, the world does look at the US, does Europe need to take some responsibility and build a sovereign defense tech industrial base that can be relied upon? I guess it's the onus of not just following what the US does, but taking on some responsibility uh, of, of one's own. Yeah, I think the, the, I think the more diversity and the the more resiliency we have in a def defense industrial base, the better. Uh, you know, I work for a, a major uh, defense company, aerospace and defense company, and I think the more you can source from multiple sources, the more you can partner in different ways. A lot of there's a lot of fine European countries and, and look uh, Asian countries as well that produce great tech, and I think it would be very helpful to not just the United States but the alliance writ large to have that diversity. And we've we've seen now in, in light of production timelines being stretched out that we need resiliency as well. And my concern actually is we'll build it out and then we'll forget about this moment and we'll, we'll go back to where we were, where it was just in time production. But I think as we look ahead, we need to figure out also not just ways to diversify and build resiliency, but then to sustain it. And that takes money. It takes money. And you know, that's ultimately the problem, isn't it? Where does the money come from? Well, um, it, 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 it comes down to priorities. But we've, you know, globally, cost of living crisis, where do you prioritize? You've got families who are not eating, people not having a roof over their heads. Where, how do you prioritize and how do you bring everyone with you on that message? On well, that I'm, nobody's suggesting we take food out of people's mouths. But, but look, in, in my view, national security comes first. It's the first responsibility of government. If you can't secure your nation, protect it, protect your people, then what do you have? And this is a complaint. By the way, bipartisan complaint in the United States. It was voiced by Trump, but before him, um, o Obama and Bush and Clinton, and we can keep going back, that we need to see more investment by Europe and other allies in their own uh, defense. And, uh, and, and look, I know, it, I, I know it costs money, but it gets back to prioritization. And that's why you see a lot of fatigue in the United States. It's why the message of of we, we shouldn't be supporting Ukraine because it costs so much resonates in the United States because a number of other people will point out stark facts and figures. I mean, today we have 31 countries in NATO, right, with Finland's recent accession, and only seven of them are meeting their 2% commitment. Seven. Seven out of 31, and we're now in the largest land war in Europe since the end of World War II. You would think that the numbers would skyrocket. And yet, uh, I'm convinced, because I was in Stockholm and Helsinki last week, and I, those Nordic countries, much like you know, folks here in Slovakia, know Russia really well. And the view from those capitals is that there, there, is, no, there, there is no optimism after Putin. If, if somehow Putin were to go away or he'd be displaced, the view is that you're only going to get somebody in who's as bad as Putin, if not worse. And so I think we need to gird ourselves for a decades-long contest here. And I, I hate saying that because I grew up in the Cold War, was glad to see it end. Uh, you know, I was... I was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division the day the wall came down, and I was here in Europe right after the Soviet Union dissolved in the early 90s. I've seen it all, and I hate the fact that we're going back to that, but we need to, get, we need to start getting ourselves back in that mindset. A decades-long conflict. 
decades with a decades. S, plural, yeah. Not conflict in Ukraine, but conflict with Russia. Conflict with Russia. Do you think, just in terms of Putin's ability to carry on like this, I mean, surely there's got to be an end game in sight. Well, there's, I'm sure there are people here who are more expert than me, but um, look, he's, with, with all the sanctions being placed on him, financial, economic, tech, etc., I don't see how he can materially, materially sustain the fight for an extended period of time, as compared to Ukrainians, if we, can, we, we continue to support them. Uh, he, he does have a manpower advantage that the Ukrainians don't. And uh, so those are the two big factors. That's why I think uh, the, the possibility that China coming into the fray and assisting the Russians with uh, lethal weaponry is, would be such a game changer. And I think, you know, I think the White House, um, it was another strategic release of intelligence about what the Chinese were playing. I think it was clever, if, if that was the case, to kind of back them off. But we need to watch that very carefully. As we wait for more questions to come from the room, thank you very much. Just following on from you were saying in terms of China's support for, uh, for Russia, Francesco Rocchetti, and apologies, I've massacred that surname, I'm sure. If the situation in Ukraine gets worse and worse, are boots on the ground an option or never again? And it's, it's uh, Francesco who brings up Afghanistan and Iraq. I don't want to get told off again, but, you know, this was your domain. Well, I, I never take anything off the table. I mean, we, we, we took that off early in the war. I said about misstatements. I would, have, I would never take anything off the table because I said at the time, this is like uh, February 15th, something that period, you don't take stuff off the table because you never know how horrible the war is going to get. And at some point, the moral outrage. And look, we've seen atrocity after atrocity. The city is devastated, civilians killed, <laughs> mass murder, rape, etc. shipping children out of their country. I mean, it, it can't get much worse. And at some point, uh, the moral outrage will be there. So I don't take anything off the table. And look, um, on the other two parts, I, 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 the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was abysmal. We can talk about that. I actually, I personally felt it was time uh, to move as well. But there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. But look, don't discount the fact that for 20 years and over a trillion dollars, the American people and American service members fought and died in that country to give them a chance to live not under Taliban rule, but under a democratic uh, country. And so America has a lot of staying power. Don't, don't count us out. But we also recognize that the world was changing. China on the rise, Russia on the rise. We can't do everything all the time. The exit plan wasn't very elegant, though, was it? And we'll, no one's going to forget those images on the, in the airport. No, we, we, thought we lost 13 brave service members, 12 Marines, one soldier. It was terrible. And we left Americans behind. It was horrible. So... How do we know? How can you convince the rest of the international community that there is an exit plan, whatever happens next with, with say, Ukraine, for example? Maybe there's somebody what? here from the Biden administration that can take that <laughs> question because I can't answer it. You can't answer it or won't answer it. Well, I'm, I'm just saying they have, to defend their, they have to defend what they did and why. I, I, I argued, I mean, <clears throat> uh, this, if you roll back the clock to October 2020, President Trump was promising that American troops would be out by Christmas of that year. And I had wrote him a classified memo saying, we shouldn't do it, we can't do it, these are all the reasons why, you know, it would encourage, it would encourage Putin, it would upset our allies. I mean, there was a whole list of things. And of course, I was fired two weeks later. And so I, I opposed a precipitous withdrawal from Afghanistan. I thought we should have held at 4,500 troops and then, and then um, forced them through either violence or the threat that we would never leave to live up to their terms of the agreement. Uh, but that wasn't the path that was taken uh, by either Trump or, uh, or Biden. So I, I don't know what the explanation, but that would have been my process going forward. Thank you. Thank you for being candid, as always. And we do appreciate the, the candid way in which you're answering these questions. And um, I'm sure you're getting quite annoyed with me already. So let this gentleman put a question to you, Mark. Secretary Esper, uh, Gautam Rana, U.S. Ambassador to Slovakia. So as the representative of President Biden to Slovakia, let me answer that question. Oh, there you go. Um, wow. I can assure you, I mean, we've talked quite a bit about the U.S. campaign, what might happen, what might not happen. 
But I'm a career foreign service officer. I'm not a political. But what I can tell you is that this president is absolutely committed to Ukraine. And he is president until January 2025. So I think what we can be absolutely assured of is for the next two years, the United States will have the full, uh, Ukraine and Europe will have the full support of the United States. And thank you very much, Secretary Esper, for noting that this is bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. Every congressional appropriation for Ukraine has received significant bipartisan support. When Senator Mitch McConnell was at the Munich Security Conference in February, he noted the strength of the bipartisan support, the Republican support for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. This will continue. And I think we've shown that, both Republicans and Democrats, that we are committed to making sure that Ukraine is successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and thank you, thank you, for um, Ambassador, for uh, just coming up and picking up on that. We really do appreciate it. Do you, we've got one more question in the room just behind us while the microphone is making its way to you. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, I'm Younes Kazi from Global Diplomatic Forum in London. And uh, uh, my question, first of all, the comments, I do res do respectfully disagree with the uh, the secretary points on the uh, strategic autonomy of Europe because I think you can't uh, guarantee uh, the U.S. policy, security policy for future administration. Uh, the, the second question is, as you said, that you do not take anything off the table. So uh, do you think that maybe boots on the ground can maybe result in some kind of nuclear war? Uh, and uh, what's your saying? Uh, Views on that. This other question is: Do you think that that we Ukraine is suffering from uh, neutrality of most of the parts of the world, and this neutrality is a result of U.S. policies in uh, Latin America, in the Middle East? So, do you think that U.S. policy uh, has contributed to? to the situation of in Ukraine? Thank you. Has U.S. policy contributed to, to the situation? in Ukraine, Mark. Which, which the current situation or the, the fact that how it began? That's the current situation and uh, because there is neutrality. There is neutrality of most of parts of the world. So the uh, most parts of the world, Latin America, as you mentioned, Brazil, India, Middle East are not contributing to, to support Ukraine or at least they are not uh, part of the sanction regime. So this is maybe uh, as a result of U.S. past policies in Latin America on the invasion of Iraq. So it's the, it's the ripple effect. We get it. Thank you. A fascinating question, a quite a I, big one. You know, I, I'd have to think through that. Um, but my, my reaction is no. Uh, I, I think there is a relationship between Moscow and... Uh, between Russia and Brazil that I don't fully understand. And so there's that. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, folks who are playing the non-aligned game. Uh, you see some of that in Africa as well. So I, I, I don't see that as the case. To me, this is a very simple act of aggression by uh, one country against its smaller neighbor, democratic neighbor. So it, it, to, to kind of link all those things that somehow they're kowtowing, if you will, to American policy. I, I, I think you would think that their own policy would be that we will support fellow democracies in terms of being illegally invaded and our, and our company being, country being pillaged. So I can't explain their positions. We have gone full circle around the world and we've covered lots of different bases. Thank you so much to all of your questions that were brought in, anonymously or not. Thank you. I'm very grateful to you for them. Our next session starts in a few minutes time and we've got four foreign ministers who will be moderated by the former president of Estonia, Kersti Kaljuliade. So do stay with that, that for that. That's going to start in just a few minutes time. But for now, can you please a big, a very big round of applause for my guests for being so, so candid, Dr. Mark Esper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.